Yes, hello there and welcome. Now today I want us to look at a chemistry paper one from three and let's begin from the first question. So the first question, as you can see, it's a table of the periodic table and the question is asking, the table below shows information about the elements from K to V. So the part A of the question is asking, write down the electronic configuration of element K and element M. So you write down the configuration of these elements, element K and element M. So as you can look at the table, you can see for the table we have now the elements, then we have the groups of these elements. Apart from that, we have the ionic configuration of this element. So don't be confused, it's written electronic configuration of ion. Don't be confused, it's the electronic configuration. Since they have mentioned that this is an ion, therefore this configuration automatically now becomes now the ionic configuration of the element. Therefore, now let's look at answering the question. So what is the configuration of element K? So for the configuration of element K, it's going to be 286. Why did we say it is 286, the configuration? It's because, so you can see that the ionic configuration of this element as we have been given for element K, remember? So I've been given that the configuration is 288, as you can see in the table. So the configuration, ionic configuration is 288. So remember, an ionic configuration is only obtained after the element has either gained or lost electrons. So if you look at this element K, you can see that for the element K, it occurs in group number six. And for the elements in group number six, remember we have oxygen and we have sulfur. So the, the, the atomic number of oxygen, remember, it is two, six, while that of sulfur below it should be two, eight, six. Therefore, for these elements in group number in group number six, they react by gaining two electrons in order to become stable. So for this element K, you have been told that it is in group number six. Therefore, it reacts by gaining two electrons in order to become stable. So being given the only, the only configuration as 288, it means that this is the only configuration after the element K has gained two electrons. Therefore, to write now the electronic or the atomic configuration of element K, we just have to remove or subtract that two electrons that were gained in the ionic configuration in order to have the atomic configuration which the question is asking. Therefore, for this, we are going to say that the atomic configuration of element K is 286. After, remember, we have subtracted the two that the element had gained being given the ionic configuration. So the electronic configuration, therefore, becomes 286. So the next element was element M. Uh, and for this element M, we have been told that its configuration is 28. So looking at element M, you'll realize that this element M is from group number two. And for the elements in group number two, remember, they react by losing two electrons in order to become stable. For these elements in group number two, remember, we have helium, we have beryllium, we have magnesium, and finally we have calcium. So all these react by losing two electrons in order to become stable. Exception being the helium, because helium is a stable element and that's why it can be able to fit in group number eight because it's stable. And since it, it also has two electrons in the outermost energy level, it can also be able to fit in group number two. As in our case, that's why we also include helium because it has two electrons in the outermost energy level. So for the group two elements, remember we say that they react by losing two electrons in order to become stable. So for our element M, is in group number two. For the ionic configuration we have been given for element M again, remember, it is two, eight. So for this ionic configuration, remember, this element M has already lost the two electrons for us to be given the ionic configuration, which is only two, eight. Therefore, for the electronic configuration or the atomic configuration of element M, we have to include these two from the ionic configuration which had been lost in order to have now our atomic configuration. And by this, therefore, the answer for the element M is going to be 282. Remember, these two we have added are the two that were lost in order to get the ionic configuration, which is only 28. So again, remember, for element K, it is 286. And for the element M, remember, it is 282. So now let's look at the next question. So the next question is asking, write down the formula for element L. So what is the formula for the element L? 
for the ion, sorry, for the ion of element L. So for the element L, if you look at the element L in the table, you are going to realize that this element L is in group number 6. It is also in group number 6. For the configuration of element L, though the question is not asking about that, but the configuration of element L, ionic, you are going to see that it is 2, 8. So that's the ionic configuration. If we, have been asked, if we had been asked to write the atomic configuration or the electronic configuration of this element, therefore we could have said that its atomic configuration is 2, 6. Because remember this only configuration, we have obtained it after this element has gained two electrons. But now getting back to the question, we have been asked to write the formula of the ion of L. Therefore for the formula of the ion of the L, we have to know uh, how many electrons does this L gain or lose. Since it's, this L is in group number 6, we can say that it gains two electrons in order to become stable. And simply to write this answer, you only need to write the letter L with its valency. So it has a valency of 2 with a charge of negative. Therefore, the answer to this is L2 negative. That is the formula of the ion of L. So the next question, which is uh, Roman 2 is asking, we write the formula of the compound formed between element K and element P. So you write the formula of the compound which is formed between K and P. Remember, the question is only asking you to give the formula. So even if you know the equation, it's advisable not to write the equation. Only write the formula because that is the only thing that the question is asking. We write the formula from between element K and element P. So for this formula, we are going to get P2 and then K3. That is what you are going to get, P2 and K3. So why did we say we are going to get P2 and uh, K3? So the reason we say this is because when elements in chemistry react, for them to get the product and to write the formula of the product, these elements only interchange the valency. So the valency of the first one goes below the second one. The valency of the second one goes below the first one. So in this case, the valency of K, it is 2 negative. That's the valency of, uh, of K because it's in group number 6. So the valency of K is 2, not 2 negative, but it's 2 while the valency of element P, we can see that the valency of element P is 3. So if you have been asked about the valency, ignore the charges. Don't say 2 negative, don't say 3 positive. So the valency is only 2 for K. The valency is only 3 for M. So M having a valency of 3, it means that it is a metal. Because metal, remember, they react by losing electrons. Since the valency of K, it is 2 and for its charge is going to be two negative, it's in group number six also, it means that this is a non-metal. Since uh, this element P is in group number three, it means that that is a metal. Because remember, group one, group two, and group three, they are all metals. Group four is a metalloid. Then group five, six, seven, eight, those are non-metals. Therefore, in writing this product, you must always begin with the metal and then the non-metal to follow. Now, since we know that element P is a metal, therefore our formula begins with P and then followed by K. So the valency of element P is 3. So this 3 is going to go below the K. The valency of K is 2. So this valency is going to go below the, below the P. And that's why for the formula for this we are having, the formula for this we are having P2 and then K3. That is what is being asked in the question. The formula, so it's P2K3. So the next question, um, the next question is asking, the pH values of solution A, B, C, and D are given in the table below. As you can see here, uh, those are the elements with the pH. So the element A, first of all, you have been told that its pH is 9.8, element B is 2.0, element C is 5.2, and then finally element D is 13, it's 12, sorry. So the first part of question is asking which solution is, uh, is likely to be a strong acid. So the first one, which solution is likely to be a strong acid? So in A, B, C, and D, which solution is a strong acid? The only strong acid here that we have is element or is solution B rather. That is the only solution uh, having a pH which is a strong acid because we see that element B is 2.0. So remember in the pH scale, between 0 pH to, to 2 pH, that is a strong acid. 
between three to six, that is a weak acid. For the seven, for the seven we have, um, it is neutral, for seven it's neutral. And then between eight to 12, that is a weak, uh, it's a weak base. And then from 13 and over, that is a strong base. So in this case, we have been told which is the strong acid. And in this case, our strong acid is element B because it has a pH of two. So Roman two is asking a weak base. So a weak base according to this table, so the weak base is going to be C, uh, to be A, sorry, which is 9.8. So that is a weak base. And then finally, lemon juice. So lemon juice, is a, it's a weak base. So since lemon juice is a weak base, therefore its pH is going to be, now the pH for 5.2. That is now the pH of the lemon juice. So for this, the answer to give is C, that is for the lemon juice. So question number three is asking, we have been told that in an experiment, two similar boiling tubes were filled with carbon-4 oxide. One of the boiling tubes was inverted over a trough containing water, and the other was inverted over a trough which contains sodium hydroxide solution. So now the question is asking, draw two diagrams to show the result obtained after 10 minutes. So first of all, we are going to draw the, the inverted... Uh, the inverted boiling tube which was inverted in uh, in water sorry and then after that you're going to draw a boiling tube which was inverted in concentrated sodium hydroxide so the first thing that you should know before answering this question is that carbon dioxide readily dissolves in sodium hydroxide so if carbon dioxide readily dissolves in sodium hydroxide it will be like if we invert this boiling tube in sodium hydroxide, the boiling tube containing carbon dioxide in sodium hydroxide, what's going to happen is that the level of sodium hydroxide is going to increase in the boiling tube which contains carbon dioxide. This is because carbon dioxide is highly soluble in sodium hydroxide. So if you look at the two diagrams, this is how the two diagrams are going to look. So for the diagram for sodium hydroxide, you're going to realize that the level, the level of sodium hydroxide or the liquid inside from the trough inside the boiling tube will have increased while for the water no observable change will be observed so this is because water does not really readily dissolve carbon for oxide but sodium hydroxide rapidly and readily dissolves carbon for oxide this is explained by the level of sodium hydroxide from the trough filling the boiling tube so to answer our question that is what you should draw in the diagram so part B of the question was asking, state one property of carbon dioxide that makes it suitable to be used in fire extinguishing. So which property of carbon dioxide makes it suitable to be used in fire extinguishing? So the first one we can see that carbon dioxide is denser than air. So since this carbon dioxide is denser than air, if you spray that carbon dioxide on the flame, first of all, you should spray the carbon dioxide below the flame or, yeah, where the flame, the source of the flame is where you should spray the, cap, the fire extinguisher. You should never spray the fire extinguisher on the flame. It is wrong because the flame won't go off. You should only spray the fire extinguisher below the flame. So that's, uh, uh, for the reason for this is because if you spray this carbon dioxide below the flame, we see that the carbon dioxide is denser than air. Since it is denser than air, it's going to occupy all the surface which has been occupied by the flame, or it's going to occupy at the base of the flame. If it occupies the base of the flame, it's going to, it's going to substitute all the oxygen which is found on the base of the flame. If it substitutes all the oxygen on the base of the flame, we see that that flame is not going to receive enough oxygen for the process of combustion. If this happens so, the flame is soon going to go off because there is no oxygen to support uh, further combustion, as to as how the carbon dioxide has already occupied the area which was occupied by the oxygen to facilitate combustion. Therefore, now that brings us now to the point of saying that carbon dioxide it is denser than air. Since it's denser than air, it can well be able to be used in fire extinguishing because it will occupy the base of the flame which was occupied by oxygen to facilitate the process of combustion. So apart from that, we can say that this carbon dioxide does not support combustion. Since carbon dioxide does not support combustion, yes, it can be used very well in process of fire extinguishing. Apart from that, we see that this carbon dioxide, when leaving the fire extinguisher, it leaves being very cold. 
this carbon dioxide is very cold. So since it is very cold from the tank, it can be able to cool the flame easily. And remember this, when, where there is no heat, there can never be a flame. So since this carbon dioxide is very cool, it readily cools the flame there, uh, thereby leading to its extinguishing. And since we have discussed about now carbon dioxide, we can briefly look at the topic of carbon and its compounds only in the preparation of carbon dioxide. So for this preparation of carbon dioxide, remember we say that we are going to react dilute hydrochloric acid as you can look in this experiment. So we're going to react dilute hydrochloric acid with calcium carbonate. So remember what we studied in Form 1, the topic of acid basis indicators. We say that any time an acid is going to react with the metal carbonate, so we are going to get salt, we are going to get water, and then we are also going to get carbon for oxide. So for this laboratory preparation, that is the advantage we are using. We are reacting an acid together with the metal carbonate in order to get now the carbon for oxide that we need. So in this experiment, as you can see, we are reacting an acid which is dilute hydrochloric acid with calcium carbonate, which is a metal carbonate. So the first step, um, so after the first chamber of reaction, the gas is taken to the next chamber which contains sodium hydroxide, sodium hydrogen carbonate. So what's the function of this chamber containing sodium hydrogen carbonate? So this sodium hydrogen carbonate is used to absorb all the hydrogen chloride gas that were formed in the previous chamber. That's the function. So the sodium hydrogen carbonate is used to absorb all the hydrogen chloride gas that had been formed in the first chamber whereby uh, the diluted chloric acid was reacting with calcium carbonate. So apart from that, we see now the gas from the second chamber enters into the third chamber whereby we have now the concentrated sulfuric acid. So for this chamber containing concentrated sulfuric acid, if any gas in chemistry is is dissolved in concentrated sulfuric acid, what we see is that this um, water vapor is being removed from the gas. Or we can say that the concentrated sulfuric acid is acting as a drying agent. It is drying this gas. It is removing the water vapor which was embedded in this gas. So that's the function of any, if any gas is passed through con sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid is acting as a drying agent or it is removing water vapor from the gas. Then apart from that, we see that the gas, the carbon dioxide gas is collected using the downward delivery method or the upward displacement of air method. So just to brush through, remember that is what we discussed in the topic of carbon and its compound for the preparation of carbon dioxide. This is just one preparation. There are different preparations which we looked at in that topic, so you can rewatch the video. So in this preparation, however, you should know that you should never use sulfuric acid because you can see we used hydrochloric acid to react with the calcium carbonate to get now the carbon dioxide. However, you should never use sulfuric acid in this experiment. The reason as to never use sulfuric acid is because if you use sulfuric acid, the sulfate is going to form an insoluble sulfate layer on the calcium. So if, if it forms an insoluble sulfate layer on the calcium, this is going to prevent any further reaction. So the reaction is going to stop indefinitely with the calcium having not reacted and also with the sulfuric acid having not reacted. So the reaction is going to stop indefinitely. Therefore, you should never use sulfuric acid due to this. You should use the different acids whereby hydrochloric acid is the best to use in this preparation. Yeah, so let's now look at the next question, which is question number four. And this question is asking, explain why the volume of gas decreases when its temperature de is decreased at constant pressure. So why is it that the volume of gas is going to decrease? Like, uh, like as the temperature is decreasing, the volume of the gas is also going to decrease. Like what happens in uh, a pumped football or maybe in pumped vehicle wheels? So those vehicle wheels, if you leave them on the floor or if you leave them where the temperature is cold, soon you're going to see that the pressure in those tires or the pressure in that ball has decreased. Now this, this takes us back to form three, the topic of gas law, whereby the specific subtopic is now the Charles law. Whereby for the Charles law, remember we say that it is defined as the volume of a given mass of gas is directly proportional to the absolute temperature if the pressure is maintained constant. And that is what exactly this question is asking. We have been told that everything is happening at constant pressure. 
So this question was testing on the aspect of the, of the Charles law, and as well, it was testing on the aspect of kinetic theory of matter that we studied in Form 1. So it has two major things it's testing, Charles law and also kinetic theory of matter. So for the kinetic theory of matter, remember we say that it is the or the theory states that matter is made up of tiny particles that are in constant random motion, whereby the solid particles are closely packed together, the liquid particles are fairly packed together, and the gas particles are spread apart. That is the definition of the kinetic theory of matter. Now, basing our arguments on Charles' law and kinetic theory of matter, let's now answer this question. So, to answer this question, you must put in mind we must talk about intermolecular forces between the particle. So remember, intermolecular forces are the forces which hold one particle and the next particle together. This is the force between the particles which hold them together. Apart from that, we are also going to talk about now the vibration of the particles because if we increase heat, the particles vibrate more and move apart. If we decrease the heat, the vibration of particles decreases and the particles come together. Now, since we have these two facts, let's now answer the question. So I'm going to begin by saying, in the kinetic theory of matter, we see that um, when we reduce the temperatures for matter, the intermolecular forces in matter is going to increase. As the intermolecular forces in matter is going to increase, the particles are going to come together. As these particles come together, we're going to see that their vibration is going to decrease or the vibration of these particles is going to decline. Therefore, if the vibration of these particles decline and the particles will come together, this will mean that the gas particles are going to soon form a liquid. As this happens, again, we are going to see that the volume of the gas is going to decrease. And that is how now to answer that question. So remember for the question, we have been told that the temperature decreases, the volume also decreases. And that's how you explain it. Because if the temperatures are going to decrease, the vibration of the particles is going to reduce. So the particle vibration is going to reduce. They're going to vibrate in a very low state. If this particle vibration is going to reduce, what's going to happen is that the intermolecular forces between these particles is, is going to now begin to grow strong and become strong. So the stronger the intermolecular forces between the particles, the stronger the particles are now going to come together. So if these particles are going to come together, their vibration has decreased, the overall volume of the gas is going to decrease. So whereby now this gas is going to form the next state, which is now the liquid. So if you can be able to explain that point like that, basing your facts on Charles Law and kinetic theory of matter, having mentioned intermolecular force and vibration of particles, therefore you are correct and good to go. So question B of this question was asking, a sample of oxygen gas having a volume of 210 centimeters cubed under pressure of 700 atmosphere was subjected in matter. So I've been told what will be the pressure of the same gas having a volume now of 150 centimeters cubed. So what will be the pressure? So remember, in this case, we have been given the initial volume, which is 210 centimeters cubed, and the pressure of this volume, which is 700 kilopascals. So now the question is asking, what will be now the new volume uh, the new pressure if the volume is now 150 centimeters cubed. So for this question, we see that this question is testing on an aspect now, again in gas law, which is now the Boyle's law. Because in this question, I've been told that the temperature is remaining constant. So if the temperature is remaining constant, remember, what is going to happen is that we are going to use now the Boyle's law, which is pressure one, volume one is equal to pressure two, volume two, because everything now is is as per Boyle's law. So in this case, we have been told that the pressure one is 700 kilopascals, and now the volume one is 210 centimeters cubed. The pressure two we have not been given, but the volume two we have been given to be 150 centimeters cubed. Therefore, if you substitute everything in the formula, as you can see, if you substitute everything in the formula, therefore you are going to get the final, uh, the final pressure to be 700, 980 kilopascals. So that is exactly what you are going to get. Remember, for this question, you only need to substitute. Identify the pressure one, identify the volume one, identify the pressure two, identify the volume two, and then use the information given in the question to substitute everything in order to now to get the correct answer. 
So if you substitute everything for the pressure one, volume one, and volume two, you're going to get the final answer to be 980 kilopascals, as now the pressure two, which, uh, which the question was asking. Thank you.